Oh, thank you, worship team. And good morning to everyone at ABC. Good morning. Good. Um, it's good to see all your faces here today as we come to meet. And um, we come because we want to help people come to Jesus and abide in Jesus. And that's the reason why we come. Now, I know some of us come for the pretty girls and they stay. And some come for the good speakers, but that's not going to happen today. Um, but our real, our real purpose is to come and help people grow in Jesus. And if you look at our, uh, our doctrinal statement, it says this, trusting God to see him transform our lives and the lives of others, one person at a time. And so we share this in different ways, in different places, at different times. We're all involved in this mission of helping people become total followers of God. Sometimes it's hard when we come. Sometimes it's easy when we come. Sometimes we come for the wrong reasons, Scott. Um, but they turn out to be the right reasons, which is good. But we all here are trusting God, not trusting the pastor, um, not trusting a denomination, but trusting God to transform our lives, my life and your life. And as one of the people that work here, my life needs to be transformed because I'm not perfect. I still need Jesus daily in my life. We all need Jesus. So amen to that. Amen to that. A couple of times a week, I like to exercise, and it's recreational exercise. It's not like William Black, who does uh, half triathlon marathon things for warm-up practices. If I get to the uh, letterbox and back, I'm pretty happy. Um, so a couple of times a week, I go for a, a short, non-Olympic run. And although I'm not an elite runner, I like to use my GPS watch, uh, which I'm wearing today. And they're pretty cool. They give you all the data what's going on. Um, but unfortunately, the last couple of weeks, my watch has not been working so well. At about the four-minute mark, um, the smart watch decides that I'm exercising and chooses its own app and starts logging me onto an app. The problem is the app that I'm running, it shuts it down. So I lose about four minutes of my beautiful exercise. And that's quite a lot. For, four minutes is a lot in my, you know. So I'm pretty much gutted and disappointed. Has that ever happened to you, William? Do you ever does happen to you. Okay, so me and William, we've had the same problem. <laughs> yeah, it's so annoying because I lost four minutes and I look like an idiot. I'm running along and I'm punching my thing going, reset, it's broken, reset, reestablish. And I usually get it reestablished, but I always lose that four minutes, which is so annoying. Uh, the good thing is, lately I've worked out how to fix it. What I do is I shut all the other apps off first, they're in the background, I set my preferred app, which is the Nike Plus one, um, because Nike is, is God's way of doing things. So I set it, the Nike app. You're laughing at me. Nike's in the Bible three times. It's the victory, it's our victory symbol for Jesus. So I use Nike, and, um, and it works really well now. So I've reset my thing, and I, I, and I have a lot more joy, because I get to the letterbox, go, oh, cool, I've got my four, first four minutes, get the, and then I come back. And then I can track my data, because it was so corrupted, and I'm really happy about that. So it's really cool. Today, we're going to look at a story in the Bible that talks about being restored. And the passage of scripture that we're going to look at is, um, I'm going to call it, Jesus restores both the spiritual and the physical, the brokenness that we have in our lives. Now, in the passage, it's going to restore our spiritual life, our, our, our theological understanding, and our physical life. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. And if you don't have your Bible and you're a bad Christian, I have it for you on the PowerPoint behind me. So don't worry. But use your Bible first. Scott, do you have a Bible? Okay, that's all right. Um, cool. Never mind. Awkward. Let's move on. I will be reading from the ESV Bible, and I'll read from verse 17 all the way to verse 26 so that we get the whole idea of the story going on and so we can work with it. So... Now, for those who have just joined us the first Sunday morning, we're going through a series called Exploring Jesus through the Gospel of Luke. And today we're going to look at this passage and we're going to explore who Jesus is and what he is like. So let's read together. On one of those days, he was teaching. Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee, Judea, and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was on him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing a man on a bed who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the rooftop and let him down 
with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this speaking blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question your hearts, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose before them, picked up what he had been laying on, and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. This is the word of God. So I've titled our talk today, Jesus Restores Both the Spiritual and Physical. And this will make a little bit more sense as we unpack the, set, the text together. So our passage starts off by telling us, one, Jesus draws a nationwide audience to his ministry. The text in verse 17 tells us that his ministry attracted this countrywide audience audience. Four of the three Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptist Gospels, all give us an account of this amazing historical story. And as we work through our text today, what I'm going to do is jump into those other texts. So if I say Matthew or Mark, I'm jumping to the other accounts of this text. And I'm going to do this because I think some of the other information is quite helpful. Each of the people have a different perspective. Luke's a doctor, has technical words, uh, Matthew has more of a Jewish background, and so I'll jump to the different texts just to draw out um, some information for us. So, for starters, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the account tells us that Jesus uh, was drawing a nationwide audience to um, Campania. Uh, Campania, I don't know how to pronounce the word, uh, was located in the top region of uh, Israel. You can see on my map there, and uh, by the lake also called the Sea of Galilee. Well, it's not really a sea because it's a lake, um, but they call it the Sea of Galilee. They've got a lot of few names for it. And so this audience was being attracted to the north. And in Matthew's Gospel, it tells us that Jesus had adopted the city for his ministry home base and for his personal home. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was sent off to um, Egypt because the authorities against him, as prophesied. He grew up in Nazareth. And then he went uh, to the city of Capernaum, where his home and his ministry base was. And this is where he was. So why Capernaum? Why not Jerusalem? If I was a young Jewish guy, I'd start my base at Jerusalem. Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, um, Capernaum was a prophecy fulfilled. Jesus was supposed to come from the north, from the outer, outer places of Israel. When God punished the people of Israel, he started at the edges using the foreign gods to demonstrate his discipline. And now God's going to bring his grace, and he's going to start from the, foreign, from the edges of their nation and bring it inwards. So this is to fulfill a prophecy. This is the area, the region he needed to be involved in. Secondly, it was a strategic city. He was going to minister to the whole area, and this place uh, was on a main road, and he could access to all the different villages by boat, and he could go left or right, and he could travel around. And uh, you can see all the amazing events that he did um, on the lake, around the lake, and in different cities. And then third reason is this was a, um, a mixed city. It had both Romans and Jewish people, and many other types of people that traveled through the city. It had an imperial road. There was only three imperial roads that went north, and this is one of them. So Paul probably traveled on this road when he went to Damascus, which is in the distance, in the far distance. And so it had a lot of travelers. It had Romans there who collected tax. Um, it had Roman officers there, had a centurion living there. So it's pretty, a, a pretty cool place to have your ministry base. Lots of different things going on there. And if you notice in the photograph, this is the actual photograph of the time, no. This is an illustration. You'll notice that they've got Roman buildings, and then they've got the Jewish flat houses there as well. So you've got a mixture of different styles of housing, people, um, travelers, which is a really cool place to have your headquarters. So Jesus' reputation had become well-known and wide. And so he had these distinguished guests, the Pharisees and the teachers and the scribes. The naming of these uh, leaders is the first time in the book of Luke. We've hit chapter 5, and this is the first time these guys are mentioned. Um, and they're just sitting there. 
Well, actually, sitting there means something more deeper. We say sitting there means no authority. But when you see the text saying sitting there, it means they had authority. They were the religious smart people. They were the intellectual people that knew the faith. And they were sitting there to evaluate what Jesus was doing. So they kind of got their metaphorical clipboard, sitting there evaluating, testing, seeing what Jesus is doing. And of course, this was a normal thing for them to do. They were in charge of the religious climate. And so they would be there checking out this new young rabbi's voice, finding out what is he saying, what's going on. Sadly, the Pharisees and scribes, as you would know, are the bad guys, uh, which we don't know at this point in the text. Uh, these guys had a great uh, start in their, their religious um, groups. They wanted to follow God. They wanted to know God's word. They wanted to apply God's word in their life. But over time, they drifted. They become arrogant. They become prideful. Um, they become hypocrites. And they didn't really understand God's ways. And they led other people away from God down different pathways. Luke, later on in our gospel, as we go through, will unpack their problem. And he will confront it. But here he just introduces these characters, which is pretty cool. Then there's a massive disturbance. And we see in verses um, 18 onwards that some men came, and of course they opened up the roof. Sorry to give you a, a spoiler alert there. Um, but because of such a large crowd, these guys, they couldn't bring Jesus to, um, they couldn't bring their, their friend to Jesus. Luke tells us in our text here that, he, that some men were bringing a man, a paralyzed man. Whereas in Matthew, it talks about four people. And so there are four people carrying this paralyzed man to Jesus on a bed. But because of Jesus' ministry became so popular and so well-known, there was no way that they could get their friend close to Jesus. And in Mark's gospel, it tells us that the doorways were full. Um, that the doorways were full. And also, um, if the doorways are full, the corridors are full. If the corridors are full, the room is full. And so they had no way of getting near to Jesus. So do these four men give up and say to themselves, we missed our chance, we're a little bit slow, we're too late. Well, we tried, but it didn't work. No. Do these four men say, look, this, let's just wait around and see if the crowd moves off and gets bored with Jesus, and then we can go and talk to Jesus. No. These four men were very determined to bring their friend to Jesus. And spoiler alert, they open up the roof and they're very successful in doing this. Verse 19 tells us that they uh, get on the, on the roof and they pull away the tiles. Now, young people, don't do this at home. I know you want to follow Jesus with your life, but don't do this at home. You'll get me in trouble. Okay? Um, yeah, so we can see that, the tiles. Cool. Luke's envisioning for us a Mediterranean Roman house. Most of the houses in those days in Israel were flat-roofed houses. And so they lived on top of the roofs. They, they slept in the afternoon if it was really hot. They would dry their food. They would capture water. Luke has got this technical word for tile, which represents more of a Roman uh, lifestyle house, which is uh, pretty cool. So they were on this house. And, of course, in the town he was, was a mixed kind of environment. Oh. So that's kind of the house it would have looked like. And that's the actual, that's not the actual, but that's kind of a representation of the room that Jesus would have been in. So you couldn't kind of imagine that room crowded with people. There's no way they get in. The doors are crammed full of people. And Jesus is right in the heart. They couldn't even hear Jesus. And they didn't give in. They went straight in. So how did they get on the roof? Well, in those days, you had the mixture going on, right? You had the, the Jewish houses with the flat roofs. They would all have stairs that would go up. So they could access the top of their roof. Their roof was part of their house. Our roofs are just for Sky TV and aerials and don't go on the roof or cats. But they actually used their roof as part of their life. So they had stairwells, well-built in stairwells. So they probably went up the stairwells, climbed over another roof, lifted their paralyzed man, lifted the tiles off, and then lowered Jesus in. Now this would have been a really fun photo opportunity. Imagine if they had WhatsApp in those days. And they're like, look! We're opening the roof up. And look at all the, the scared Pharisees and Sadducees sitting down there as the roof gets open up. And, of course, it's the one you don't want to put on your social media too much because you get in trouble for it too. So now this paralyzed man is actually before Jesus. And, of course, uh, we see there that Jesus says he saw their faith. Now, this is Jesus. This is God's son. He sees the faith. And the word faith is in plural. So he sees their faith, not just the one person's faith, but as a group of people. As white Westerners, we often like to think of ourselves as individual. But Jesus sees their faith, 
It's a corporate thing going on here. Now, no one can deny that these guys were pretty much um, determined to bring their friend to Jesus. This group of men had genuine faith in Jesus Christ. In the letter of uh, the book of James, we see that James, the author, connects faith and actions together. When he says in verse 18, I will show you my faith by what I do. So in the book of James, in chapter 2, he goes on to give an illustration how faith and our actions actually have a relationship. If I say I love you, but I don't buy you flowers, do I love you? Okay. So he's linking the two together. And we read in James uh, chapter 2, these words. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did and when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. They worked together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. So you see the faith and our actions work together in a partnership. And Jesus... The divine one recognizes this as actually faith. The former pastor of Wheaton Church, uh, Ken Hughes, now retired, suggests um, three ways of looking at this faith. The first one is this. Their faith was persistent. They didn't give in. A lot of the crowd were just sitting there outside the house. They couldn't hear Jesus. But these four guys didn't give in. They didn't say, well, that's not good enough for us. They actually found that they were not going to give in. They found a way to get to Jesus. These guys carried uh, their friend's body to Jesus, which is actually quite hard. Um, Once I was on um, an adventure camp. I wasn't on the camp. I was just there for three days teaching. Uh, The camp was run by Cape May. They run a six-week course in the bush and in caves and in mud. And I was only there for three days, which was nice. Then I got a shower. But during the the bush walk, um, the instructor said, oh, they made a pretend scenario. They said, this guy has now broken his ankle. You have to carry him. And so our group of nine had to carry this one individual. So we made this beautiful um, stretcher from our, our tarps, and it was a really good stretcher. But I was so surprised how heavy it was to carry this guy. And after about five minutes, I was exhausted, and I sort of let the others carry him. And when you've got four people trying to carry someone who can't move along a track, across a river, up a slight hill, it's actually really difficult, and you have to have perseverance. And I don't know if any, who's ever carried someone who can't walk. It's really, it's actually, yeah, Brian, it's really difficult. It's heavy. It's very difficult. Secondly, they were creating their faith. What they did is they didn't give in, and they thought, how do we get to Jesus? We can't push through the crowd. We'll go on the roof and open up the tiles. They're very, very creative. And this is what Jesus saw. Their faith, it was an action. And then, of course, their faith was sacrifice. They would have taken the day off work. They would have had to repair the roof. They would have probably got in trouble with the owner of the house. Imagine the owner of the house's daughter coming home one day, going, why is there the tiles off? Well, today we had Jesus, and he was doing some teaching, and people were very creative and opened up the roof. They were going to be responsible for this, and they would have to pay for it to be put back. They might have to come back the next day and repair the roof themselves. They had to take the day off work to get their friend to Jesus, There was a sacrifice being made. Whenever you read of people in church history or people in the Bible, they always make a sacrifice when they follow God to bring their friends to Jesus. When you think of people like Francis Schaeffer, financially when he set up those those places to reflect on God, cost him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer cost him his life. Uh, Corey Teen Boone. In the Bible, we've got Esther. If I perish, I perish. Abraham. Uh, left his family. Peter, um, Paul, Paul was shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, stoned, what, three or four times, not, you know, drugs, but the other kind of stoning. (laughs) He made huge sacrifices to bring people to Jesus. Does that sound like our faith? Is that the kind of faith we have? If you put your time and money and energy into our faith community, it's a sacrifice. You will not get it back. It's a worthy sacrifice. Now, the question is not, are you willing to make a sacrifice for your faith community? Because we all sacrifice all the time. For example, I like watching movies. Who likes watching movies? Okay, cool. Half of us, cool. But if I watch a movie, then I'm sacrificing my time that I should go to the gym. Who likes going to the gym? Cool. 
But if I go to the gym, then I'm sacrificing my time. I could have been reading my favorite book. And if I read my favorite book, I could be sacrificing my time that I could be with my best friends. So we all make sacrifices each day. The fact you're here today is a sacrifice. Because you could have been at the gym. You could have been, but you're not. You sacrificed your time to be here, trusting that God is going to transform our lives and the other people's lives as well. So not, the question is not, are we willing to make a sacrifice? But what are the sacrifices we're currently making in our week? What are the sacrifices that we're doing? And is that sacrifice worthy of our time? These four men sacrificed time off work, their physical energy, emotional energy, financially to repair the roof, and they thought cleverly on how to get their friend to Jesus. Now, we've got people like Darren Alexander at the back there on the sound desk. You weren't watching me, so I'm picking on you now. These people, they come an hour early to church to set up the sound gear to make it sound nice. They sacrifice their time. They're patient with the music team because the music team are very creative people. So you to be patient with them. He tries to make me sound good, which is really hard. And he does this. Now, he will not get his sleep back. Although today it's daylight saving, so you actually did get your sleep and you did serve God at the same time. So today was not a sacrifice, but generally it's a sacrifice. We all make sacrifices. And as a community, we, we make sacrifices to see people come to Jesus. We've got people who do mainly music. We've got about four people that turn up each week. Uh, we've got people that run Christianity Explored. We've got people who pray for us before church. And if you want to join the prayer team before church, come along. We'd love to have you. It's really cool. About quarter past eight. No, quarter past nine. Yeah, quarter past nine. Come together, have a quick prayer. Pray for people. So come. And I'm really proud. We've got a really cool church that's willing to um, put our faith into action, to see people come to be transformed by Jesus, which is really cool. Their work helped people. Um, they were trusting God to see him transform their lives and other people's lives. And that's what we're doing. That's why we're here. That's why we're making the sacrifice. And thank you, Scott, for becoming the treasurer. Good. You're going to sacrifice time for us. And we will never pay you anything for it, ever, which is great, apart from saying thank you. Um, but you're trusting that your work will help uh, see people transform because the lights are still working and Darren can still use the sound gear because someone paid the power bill. So, Scott, thank you for paying the power bill. You'll probably say, it's an automatic deposit. Don't have to AP, you don't have to worry. Okay, Scott. Now, some people say, well, Darren's on the sound desk because Di scheduled him on. No, Darren's on the sound desk because he wants to see people come to Jesus and believe in Jesus. And that's what we're about as a community. So by faith and love, these people lifted their friends to see Jesus. So faith is the key. Faith is the key. Hebrews uh, chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and you know this verse because you've come to church lots. Without faith, it is impossible Impossible to please God. For whoever draws near to God must believe that he exists and that he will reward those who seek him. Must believe. So faith is actually really important. I like what Charles Price says. Faith is the indispensable ingredient in our walk with God. For me, a chocolate cake needs to have chocolate. A cookie needs to have chocolate. The indispensable ingredient is chocolate. Whereas for our faith as a community, faith is that ingredient that activates God, that brings God into us. And these people, the stretcher people, they had faith. I don't know how they got the rope, but they lowered this guy down. And they would have had faith because there's no way they're going to be able to pull the guy up. They, they knew that Jesus was going to do this because you, you can't get someone up once you've lowered them down. Thus, we see that when Jesus saw their faith, what did Jesus say? Man, don't you know I'm teaching right now? You guys are disturbing me. I've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees for the first time. What are you doing? No, what does Jesus say? He says, man, your sins are forgiven. Now, sins in our world is not a very PC word to talk about, right? We don't like to talk about sin. It's, it's kind of like a dark subject. It's uncomfortable. And some people say, if you really want to help someone who's, who needs help, don't talk about sin. You know, Talk about all the other things. You know, Sin is not to be talked about. Yet, if we want to find real answers in life, we need to talk about the root problems, not the presenting problems. You know, when we pull out weeds, if you just pull off the tops, they'll regrow back because the root's still there. And sometimes it can be helpful if you just want to have a quick rip the weeds off. But you've got to get down to the deep problem, which is humanity's sin. So what does the word sin mean? 
If you take a bunch of the words in the Bible, it can kind of help us under, understand the word sin. Sin is this. Badness, rebellion, going astray, wickedness, wandering, crime, ungodliness, lawlessness, transgressions, falling away, and so on. Um, but in some ways, just having a bunch of words is kind of hard. Theologians help us understand um, sin by giving us a short little definition. And I like the one by Wayne Grugan. Wayne Grugan says this. Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. So we can see that it is tied into God. Any sin is a failure to follow what God is doing. Not what your parents might say or the government might say. It's what God says. And it can be an action. It can be in our attitude, which you can't see sometimes. And it can be or in nature. So what does sin do to us? Sin rips us away from our relationship with God, from others, and from ourselves. It destroys us. As Wayne Grugan says, and I like what he says about sin, sin is more than simply pain or destruction. It is also wrong in the deepest sense of the word. In a universe created by God, sin ought not to be. Sin is directly opposite to all that is good in the character of God. And just, as God, and just as God necessarily and eternally delights in himself and his characteristics and all that he is, so God necessarily and eternally hates sin. It is essentially the contradiction of the existence of his moral, excellence of his moral character. So God is perfect. He has no sin. There is no problem in his economy. And so he has to reject sin. It contradicts his nature. And that's why he hates sin. Can't be part of it. So, there's more to uh, understanding sin, but that's just a quick definition. We could look about the origins. We could look about um, the degrees, the punishment. But that just gives enough to continue with the story. So, Jesus forgives sins. On a positive note, in verse uh, 19, we'll see this. That he actually forgives you your sins. The word forgiveness here means to remove the guilt resulting from the wrongdoing. Now, just a clarification. God does not remove the actual physical act. If you killed someone, they're still dead. If you crash a car, imaginary story, you crash a car, it's still crashed, okay? It doesn't remove the wrongdoing, but it removes the guilt associated with doing it. It removes the punishment, the divine punishment for doing the wrong. It doesn't recreate a new story. It still happens. Gary Collins summarized guilt this way. Objective guilt, and there's a difference between objective and subjective. Subjective is like a feeling. Objective guilt is when the law has been violated and is broken and you are guilty. No matter if you realize it or not or feel it, you have uh, destroyed it. Now, Jesus being the Son of God knows our past. He knows our every sin. He knows our emotional sin, our intellectual sin, our physical sins. He knows every boundary we've ever broken. Yet at the same time, faith in Jesus Christ, he's willing to forgive us completely and wholly. So the insight here is this. Faith and forgiveness are best friends in Jesus. And last week we celebrated what Jesus did. He came to the earth. And at Easter time, he was sacrificed for our sins. Not only that, but he was risen from the dead. He rose from the dead. He conquered sin. And we, through faith, are part of that story. That we died with Jesus, we rose, we received his righteousness, not our righteousness. We can't, only he can. So forgiveness is the foundation for our Christian faith. Forgiveness in Jesus is the foundation of our Christian faith. The greatest need for us as humans is actually to avoid the wrath of God because God cannot have a relationship with sin. It cannot happen. I've got a water bottle. I just thought of this right now. If I drink from my water bottle, then I've probably what it could contaminated, right? Mm. Especially if I do backwash. Now, if I gave my water bottle to Scott and said, would you like to drink from my water bottle? Okay, take the cap off. I thought he would say that. Normal people, not Scott, would say, I'm not drinking from your water bottle because there's now contamination. So we can't have a relationship with God because there's contamination. Although Scott would drink it. And probably catch mono. Okay. So forgiveness is really, really key. 
And along these lines, I like what John, Stotts, uh, John MacArthur says when he expresses the importance of forgiveness. He says this, What sends people to hell? You say sin. No. It is not sin alone that sends people to hell. It is unforgiven sin. It is unforgiven sin that sends people to hell. Hell is only occupied by people whose sins have never been and will never be forgiven. Heaven, on the other hand, is occupied by people who sin, including me, who have their sins forgiven. Therefore, what causes people to escape the wrath of God in eternal, eternal hell is the forgiveness of their sins. That forgiveness is humans' greatest need to move from hell to heaven. And I like this. Ultimately, God does not send us to, to, to hell. Ultimately, it's when we do not accept the forgiveness that he's offering. And here this day, Jesus gives this man forgiveness. He recognizes his faith. That only through Jesus Christ, not our ability, not coming to ABC every week, but you should come to ABC every week. It's not that you should give money to ABC. You can give money to ABC. It's not through that. It's actually through Jesus alone, what he did for us on the cross. And then out of that, we have a transformed life. And things start changing. Our attitude starts changing. Our behavior starts changing. Number three, now we see Jesus receives some criticisms about his ministry. And there's always those people who want to criticize you, no matter what you do, sports, education, politics. And so the Pharisees are, are there, and um, they hear what's going on. The crowd doesn't really understand their theological significance, but the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they catch on to the theology here. And firstly, they respond to themselves by saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Because Jesus was offering forgiveness to a man's sin who could not walk. Now, the idea of blasphemy is to speak against someone in such a way as to harm or injure their reputation. So one way you can do blasphemy is by defaming God, by saying that you have equality with God. Because if I said I'm as good as Michael Jordan, either I'm pulling myself up or pulling Michael Jordan down. And in this case, I'd be pulling myself, I'd be pulling myself up and pulling Michael Jordan down. So blasphemy is here is they recognize that Jesus is saying that he is what? God. Now, so they got that right. He's actually claiming that he is God. But does that mean um, that it's wrong? No. Because who is Jesus? Jesus is actually God. So he's not, com he's not causing blasphemy because he's actually God. For me saying, I'm as good as Michael Jordan, that's blasphemy. But for Jesus, I forgive. He's not bringing God's name down because Jesus is God. He has the power, the authority to forgive. Whereas here, the Pharisees' uh, understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, is revealed as broken. Because Jesus is the one, the way to God. So what's our personal convictions around Jesus the pathway to God? As a church, are we trusting Jesus to transform our lives? Or do we have a different pathway? Um, over the last fortnight, I've been reading uh, work by C.S. Uh, Sproul, Sproul. And I've not read Sproul before. I haven't heard of him before. Um, so I've only in the last two weeks actually read him. Who's heard of Sproul before? Yeah, all of you. Okay, I'm the only one. Me and Darren. Have you heard, have you heard of him before, Darren? You have? Okay. Well, I haven't. So I was reading him this week, and I found him quite interesting and really, really good. And he said this one line I thought was, was, was bang on. The real issue in the Christian life is whether or not we see Christ as the authority of God himself. Now, for us that hang out at church all the time, we're like, oh, that's boring, Hayden. Okay, let's move on. It's phenomenal what we're saying. We believe that Jesus was Emmanuel, that God came down as one of us and died for us on the cross. If Tom thought he weirded people out at work, with creation, you can really weird people out when you say, we believe that Jesus is actually God, that he actually chose to come to us. It's a phenomenal, beautiful truth that we have, that God came to be one of us. So Jesus was actually uh, God, which is cool. <clears throat> As a ch church, we're here to help people what? Come to Jesus and abide in Jesus. We're not here to teach pipe psychology or... Um, philosophy or amazing principles we're here to teach about the person of jesus christ and that's the difference we're a church that surrounds ourselves focuses ourselves on jesus you might learn some good principles you might learn some good ways of thinking but it's all about the person of jesus next we see in verse uh, 22 
Jesus asked insightful questions about his ministry. Our text teach, it tells us that Jesus knew their thoughts. How did he know their thoughts? Because he's God. He knew their thoughts and their content. Why do you know their content? How can you know someone's content? Could you be married to them 50 years? No. He is God. He can understand their thoughts and the content in their, what's going on. So the first question that Jesus asks is this. Why do you have questions in your heart? Now from the account of Matthew, Matthew 9, 4, we see that he says, Why do you have evil thoughts in your heart? Now Jesus asks them a reflection question to help them process what's going on in their heart. So Jesus knew what they're thinking and the content they're thinking. The word heart here is a, a figure of speech. It means their psychological aspect, their thinking. So in their heart, in their thinking, they're thinking evil thoughts. Why? Because they do not know God. They've made their own way, their own pathway to God. And of course, Jesus knew this. He's not surprised by this. And so Jesus is going to take this an opportunity to teach them. Jesus is now going to link the spiritual healing that he's done with the physical healing. And so Jesus himself will ask the next question. And the next question he asks is this. Which is he to say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Now Jesus himself never gives us the answer. And you read through all the little scholarly books, all the scholars have a different opinion. So today I'm going to ask you, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? And we'll take a church vote, and then we'll make that our doctrine. No, no, we won't. It's actually quite a tricky question, and Jesus never answers it. It kind of makes you think. It's kind of like a riddle. What's going on here? What's really going on here is he's logically linking it to authority. You can only really say, well, actually, you could say both. I've just said it. Your sins are forgiven. Rise and walk. You can say them physically. But if you say them with authority... You'll see if someone has got a healing, because you can look at it straight away. If someone's forgiven of their sins, it might take a while to see the transformation in life. But what Jesus is doing is linking it to the authority. Because if you have to do both, or any of them, you need to have authority from God. Because God is in control of this universe. And so we see that. So what's going on next? Jesus performs a powerful ministry to support his, his ministry going on here. So that you might know, the Son of Man has authority, so he's linking it to what he's going to do. He demonstrates a miracle. Now, Charles Price makes a really good point here. We've got to be careful that when we look at Jesus' miracles, we don't say, this miracle is an evidence that he is God. Because different people in history have done miracles. We've got Elijah, Peter, Stephen, Peter, Paul. They all did miracles. Were they God? No. So a miracle in itself doesn't point the fact that you're God. It, what it does point is that God is using your life, that God is trusting you and you are his servant. In Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 22, it tells us this. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man credited to you by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. So Jesus doing a miracle doesn't say that he is God directly, but it shows that he's approved of God. If Jesus wasn't approved from God, if Jesus was saying something wrong, God wouldn't work through his life. And so this shows us that actually he's approved of God. And what is he telling us? I am the son of God. Same when he got baptized. He got baptized and the, the dove came down and said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. These are signs that Jesus is God, that he's God the son, which is pretty cool. Amazing. Thus, Jesus um, says to the parallels, man, and you can kind of feel what's going to go on now. It's kind of cool. And if you don't know the story, he gets to walk, which is really cool. He says, pick up your mat, your bed, and go home. Jesus wants them to know that he has accreditation from God. And it happens what? You see the word there? Immediately. Now, some of us who have been around in this place for a while go, oh, that's really nice. He does another miracle. Great. There's 30 miracles in the, New in the Gospels, and there's 30 miracles in Acts, and it's really nice. And let's have a cup of tea. But let's just stop for a minute. He does a miracle. He does something that we can't do immediately. Have a think about it. Because this blew the crowd away. This blew the crowd away. First of all, if you have someone who can't walk, you've got to fix their back. And so far in our technology, we can't do an operation. If you're like Superman who fell off that horse, there is no operation to bring Superman back. Um, 
even if, you know, maybe in the future we'll be able to get the technology. And I'm praying that maybe some doctors, maybe one of our young doctors here will learn a procedure to help us fix the spinal cord. But at the moment, we can't do it. And if we could do it, it would probably take, what, 15 hours in a surgical ward with nurses and blood and, and bolts and screws. But it wouldn't be immediately. And this happened immediately. Straight away, no 12-hour operation. We don't have the technology yet. The back is fixed. Secondly, the muscles. If you don't use your muscles, apart from William, for a couple of days, they go to nothing. They just disappear. I had a friend at school, he broke his right arm, and I'm not proud of the story, but we used to tease him. Because when he got the cast off, after six weeks, he had this like shrunk arm, so I called him skinny arm. And the funny thing was, he broke the other arm. And then this arm got muscles back after six weeks, and this one was skinny, so we keep calling him skinny arm. And um, it was, I'm embarrassed about it now. But the point of the story is this. If you don't use your muscles, they disappear very quickly. Within about three days, they start to go away, which is totally unfair. Jesus healed this guy instantly, immediately. Thirdly, establish the walking balance. If you look at a child, they're learning how to balance their inner ear. If you've been laying in a hospital bed for some time, when you first stand up, you're kind of like dizzy because you've got to learn your balance. And then fourthly, enable the coordination. If you've not walked for a while or never walked, it's quite an activity to learn. Like skipping. You know, you, learn, you see kids learning to skip? It's quite difficult. And this happened immediately. So, gang, for us who've been in church and Jesus does miracles, but just stop and think. This is amazing what God does. This is God. He can actually stop and manipulate and change our world that win. But more importantly... He can stop and manipulate and get rid of our sin, the guilt. And that is amazing. It's amazing what he can do physically, but spiritually to heal us through the cross of Jesus, even for more phenomenal. And that is our most important thing. We're relationship beings. I was reading a counseling book this week to see if I could find anything cool about it, but it was too big and I couldn't finish the book. <clears throat> but one thing it said in the book was this. Most people go to counseling for guilt and forgiveness. It's usually tied into, it doesn't matter what you do. If you crash a car, there's guilt. If you um, steal money from work, there's guilt and shame involved. Most of it comes back to this. And this is what God healed us off. Okay, moving on. We're not told how to respond. When you read this story, there's no like, as a preacher looking for, how are we supposed to respond? It doesn't tell us how to respond. It does tell us how the crowd responds. In Matthew, it specifically says the crowd, which would not include the Pharisees and Sadducees. So this is how the crowd respond. They respond with awe, amazement. They've just seen this guy walk. It's amazing. It's cool. And so I guess the question for us is, how do we respond? How do we respond when we see someone getting saved, having their sins forgiven? How do we respond when we see God doing a miracle, a timing miracle or a, a different kind of miracle? And do we trust God? Do we want to bring our friends to Jesus? Do we want to open up the roofs? Do we want to do some of this gracious, violent stuff? Are we willing to pay that price? Are we trusting God for him to transform my life and your life? As a church, we're here to help people come to Jesus and know Jesus. And I'm really proud to be part of this church. We're a good church. We do so many cool things. So let's just keep our focus on what we're about on Jesus. Now, just before I pray, uh, the worship team is going to come up and lead us in one more song. And I believe the song they're going to sing is um, Yet Not I But Christ In Me, which is really a great song. It's a great way to respond to what we've heard today. And I think the words go like this. What gift of grace, Jesus, my Redeemer. We have got a Redeemer called Jesus. We don't know special principles or special philosophy, but we have someone special called Jesus. So let me pray, and then uh, we'll get an opportunity to respond in worship. Father, I thank you for Jesus, Lord. Lord, um, we know that Jesus is the Son of God, but Lord, help us again to fall in love with the fact that Jesus forgave us our sins. Lord, I thank you for the significant um, thing you did for us, Lord. You eliminated our guilt. You eliminated the thing that's stopping us from having a relationship with you, Lord. You have given us the ability to be in heaven, to be with you. You paid a horrible price on a cross last Easter for us, Lord. 
But you rose again, the power of God. You conquered sin and death. And Lord, I thank you that you are our righteousness. Uh, you are our life. Lord, um, may we respond to you appropriately. All God's people said, Amen.